let's have a quick go on the first question then. What are you hoping to get out of the event today? Can you go on to Slido, press the appropriate button, and we'll see what people in the room think. So what are you hoping to get out of today? Lots and lots of you have been deprived of networking and 3D images of people. Inspiration ideas. So. That's great. And hopefully we'll provide all of those things for you. How has your business been impacted over the last couple of years? Positively? Uncertain, negatively. Certainly a lot of damage done to this sector over the last couple of years. And how optimistic are you for the year ahead? Positive, uncertain, or feeling quite negative about the year ahead? Good buzz in the room, that's what we like. So this summit is all about being inspired, hearing from industry experts, growing your local network, getting access to free training, meeting like-minded businesses, and perhaps even future suppliers. Hopefully that will all help with our recovery as we now start to plan forward. Uh, to, 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 help, to help keep the buzz around today's event going, we've got a competition uh, and, and uh, looking to, to spread the word about uh, the, the Tourism Summit. It's going to be running across all of our social channels. The winner will receive £150 in vouchers to spend at any um, Buckinghamshire tourism, leisure or hospitality venue. And to enter, all you need to do is use the camera on your phone to scan the QR code and click through to your chosen platform. Tag at least one fellow Buckinghamshire business owner in the comments section. Share the post to your timeline, making sure you tag in Buckinghamshire Business First. And then make sure you're following uh, Buckinghamshire Business First on either Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, or LinkedIn. So we'll try and keep the buzz going for um, all those in the room and then all those in our, uh, our bigger network. I'm now going to pass over to Martin Tett, the leader of Buckinghamshire Council, for an overview of the support that the council has been able to provide for the sector over the last two years. Martin. We have no idea if the, uh, the slides are going to work, so this may or may not have slides associated with it, but who really matters about the slides? Anyway, um, yeah, I'm Martin Sett. I'm the elected leader of Buckinghamshire Council, so I'm, I'm that dreaded thing, a politician for my sins. Um, it's great to be invited to actually kick off this event. Um, it's a pleasure, quite frankly, to welcome those of you who aren't resident in Buckinghamshire to Buckinghamshire. Um, those of you who are in Buckinghamshire get to know the rest of the county. I'm always amazed how many people I know in my own area who when you say anything north of Aylesbury, they sort of glaze over and say, you know, what's up there? You know, and actually say there's fantastic, fantastic places right the way across this county, you know, and it's a fantastic destination of choice, I think, for lots of people. Even people from Buckinghamshire, Simon, could actually find extra places out here, let alone those strangers from London who might wander out here occasionally. Great to have Simon out here, even if he is from London. Um, so, one of the advantages of actually being a new unitary council as of just under two years ago is that we are a single large strategic council and we can take a holistic view of all of this beautiful county uh, outside of obviously Milton Keynes itself, home to Olney where pancakes were first tossed about 600 years ago. So any of you who actually tossed your pancakes last night, they came, that tradition came from Buckinghamshire as well. Uh, we're very immensely proud of this county. We're also very protective of it and its beauty. 
It's steeped in heritage and history. I know I won't insult you by asking you any of these as questions, but for example, the most famous building in Chalfont St. Giles, Milton's Cottage, where he wrote Paradise Lost and Paradise Regained. Just up the road, the Vash, home to the regicide who signed the death warrant for Charles I. I hope you're taking notes, Simon, here, right? And also statues of James Cook, the first European um, into, uh, into Australia. Many other, obviously, original inhabitants there before that. You've also got, you know, Grey's Energy um, written for uh, Stoke Poaches. You've got um, home to, uh, well, the burial place of William Penn, just down the road in Jordans, where uh, the founder of Philadelphia and Pennsylvania um, is buried, and so much more. You've got Latimer Park, home to MI5 and MI6 during the war, and actually the founding place for GCHQ. This, this county is packed with heritage and history that really should be an absolutely fascinating attraction to people from all over the country, and indeed from all over the world. But it's not just backward looking. You know, as a county, we're ambitious, we're, we're, we're modern, we're go ahead. So for example, we're home to Pinewood Studios. Uh, we've just seen two major expansions approved down there, one for studios, um, and we've just approved uh, amazing visitor attractions down there that's gonna have a Star Wars experience and a James Bond experience uh, running very, very near to here. Uh, again, I'm sure will be major tourist attractions from people from all over the UK uh, and, and indeed from all over the world. And only this week, I was at Stoke Mandeville Stadium at the launch of the Paralympics. Ludwig Goodman, who actually founded the, the Paralympics, again, uh, the home of the Paralympics here at Stoke Mandeville, just down the road from here at, at Stoke Mandeville Stadium. So, so much to come and see in the north. Obviously, beautiful Buckingham itself. But the clue is in the name. Buckingham for Buckinghamshire, the original county town, uh, and just nestling on our border, Silverstone. Uh, Silverstone Village, obviously over the border in Northamptonshire, but the entrance to the Silverstone Circuit and most of the circuit itself is in Buckinghamshire, you know, and a great place again to spend a fantastic uh, experience during the, the summer months when the F1 is running. So we're a dynamic, we're a very modern, uh, modern county, we're ambitious and a great attraction for people to come and visit. But it's, it's been a tough couple of years. I don't know what's going to come up. Oh, there we are. The slides are actually running. So, you know, it's hard to believe it's still under two years since the start of the first lockdown. You know, we had the eerie silence of April and May 2020, uh, when you could actually walk down busy roads and actually find you could hear the bird song at the side of the roads. Uh, absolutely amazing. And you find hosts of cyclists, as if you could actually buy a bike uh, at that time. Uh, that's a bit of distant memory now, I have to say. We had that boom in the autumn when we had the eat out, to, uh, eat, eat out to Help Out scheme, which I think was a great boom for the, uh, the entertainment and tourism industry. Um, I certainly enjoyed some of the Eat Out to Help Out schemes. Uh, and we had, we, you know, it was the year of staycations as well. I was up in the northeast of England, uh, seeing parts of the UK I'd never actually been to before. So, it, you know, it had ups and downs actually for the, uh, the tourism and the, the leisure sector. Uh, but actually, we as an industry, I think, have adapted over that period of time. And it's great to see that optimism reflected um, in, that, uh, in that little um, poll you did earlier. Different places have actually suffered disproportionately. So if you look at the big cities, I mean, all the indication is the big cities have suffered worse than some of the country areas and some of the market towns. Um, some of the big city areas, you go around London, there are still parts of it that are still eerily quiet. Certainly nothing like the hustle and bustle that you used to have in places like Oxford Street and Regent Street. But then you can come to some places like Aylesbury and so on, High Wycombe, where actually at weekends they are really busy now. You know, the car parks are returning to pretty well full capacity. Uh, so we've been actually doing an awful lot to try and support our areas to recover. So, for example, we've been one of those areas which has actually seen it as almost our duty to help our businesses to survive before they can thrive. Now, a lot of councils took a different approach. They hoarded the money. They've held it back. We made a strategic political decision to get that government money out the door, PDQ, quite frankly. So we spread it far and wide. We gave uh, allocations through our, particularly our additional restrictions grant um, to an enormous number of businesses across the county. Uh, and we did that every month for about four months, uh, which I know from feedback I've had has been really helpful to enabling some businesses that otherwise might have gone under to actually survive. And we're really proud to have done that. Uh, and we even gave it to sole traders, some of that excluded um, cohort that really were very critical of national government. Uh, we made a point of supporting here in Buckinghamshire as well. Uh, and obviously more recently, 
uh, we've been helping out with the, uh, the new money that came from government. We couldn't give that to sole traders, uh, but we certainly gave it because there just wasn't enough money. Uh, but we, again, targeted that um, in terms of that booster grant um, in the last month or so. We've also been working very closely with Visit Bucks in terms of how we can actually promote the visitor economy here. Again, we've just so much to offer here, so I think that's great. You look at how also the industry has adapted. I mean, one of the things we've actually learned is that you have to go online. And I think what's happened is you've seen a lot of trends that would have happened anyway. Just it's been like a catalyst. Lots of things have happened that otherwise would have taken maybe years to happen, have happened almost in months. Certainly, we've seen places like Princess Risborough had something called the Risborough Basket. The local shops there, the independent shops, got together and did an online service with local delivery. <clears throat> and we've helped other areas match that with their own online service and, and local delivery services. So we've got together something called the, the Click Online Local um, service, and we're trialing that in the north of the county. If you come from North Buckinghamshire, go online. You can see the, uh, the URL down the bottom left there. Uh, and it's a way we're trying to actually help regenerate a lot of our, uh, our high streets and keep them really vibrant. Uh, and what's still a bit of a sort of rebirth time uh, on the local economy around here. And obviously, as we've come out of COVID, there's been a lot of support in terms of the banners, the posters, the welcome back stuff, the bunting in the streets and so on. So we've been trying to do our absolute best to help not only survival, but rebirth of the visitor economy within Buckinghamshire. Try again. Hey, there we go. So just pulling that together, because I'm conscious time, and we've got Simon right behind me. I mean, one of the things I'm conscious of is that I think we're emerging now from the shadow of COVID. I think that actually, hopefully, looking ahead, things are much more optimistic. I personally don't believe we'll go back through another lockdown. I'm hopeful that the businesses that hopefully we've helped survive in the last two years will now have that opportunity to really grow and thrive in the years ahead. There is so much here in Buckinghamshire that can actually prove a really great attraction. It may not any longer be staycations. You know, it may just be weekend breaks or maybe that extra holiday where people want to come out for a day or a weekend or whatever. Uh, but there's a lot here to actually market. We also think the smaller centres, I've mentioned Aylesbury, High Wycombe, but Marlow, Buckingham and so on, can buck that trend that many of the big cities have had of seeing a downfall in footfall. I think this can become somewhere where people working partly from home, partly in the office, can actually spend their money during the week as well. So that can give some business as well. Um, and we're actually seeing that sort of combined functionality of being multi-center. You're not going to have the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker in the high streets any longer. You're going to have a mixture of attractions there. And again, that becomes part of the draw for people coming to areas like Buckinghamshire. So just in summary, it's been a fantastic county to be associated with, in my case, for nearly 50 years now. I really love Buckinghamshire. I hope you do too. Get to know it, really understand the fantastic potential there is here for the tourism and visitor economy. Uh, I hope you'll introduce your own clients to it. There is so much to see and explore here, and I look forward to talking with you uh, and obviously discussing this with you uh, in the breaks we've got ahead. But I'm gonna hand you over now straight to Philippa again, and then to Simon. So thank you very much indeed. Please enjoy your morning, and the council stands fully behind BBF and this fantastic initiative today. Thank you. Thanks, Martin, and, and thank you for all the really valuable support that the Council has provided uh, to this sector. So the tourism and hospitality sector in, in Buckinghamshire is significant, and it provides almost 10% of the employment opportunities in the county. The visitor economy is huge, with many, many businesses feeding into the sector. In fact, when we, when we talk about the visitor economy, do you know there's not many businesses that don't feed in somewhere into the visitor economy? The visitor economy is dominated by SMEs, so small businesses, and crosses a number of business sectors. So, for example, hospitality, accommodation, transport, land management, heritage, culture, museums, and retail and the high street. It is diverse and fragmented in nature. This is a characteristic of the industry throughout the UK and it's no different in Buckinghamshire. We have lots of potential and growing room here in beautiful Buckinghamshire, the birthplace of the Paralympics. 
We currently have an underdeveloped offering compared to some of our neighbors. So when visitors come here, we lack the product that they can buy. So there's masses of opportunity in, in Bucks. Buckinghamshire Business First has secured a Community Renewal Fund Award to support hospitality, leisure and tourism. The, the overarching aim of the funding is supporting the growth of businesses operating in the Buckinghamshire economy as we now go forward. There are many, many opportunities to grow turnover if you operate within the visitor economy. To diversify what you offer to visitors, both from the local geographies and from further afield. We aim to support businesses to extend their season, to obtain loyal customers, and to gain a share of massive new markets. The support aims to help businesses and individuals to come back more resilient to future challenges, and there's going to be some, we know to be more sustainable and more inclusive to engage the widest possible range of potential customers. This project is aimed at upskilling businesses now in how to diversify their offerings and to grow their current bookings. This in turn is going to boost your visitor numbers, your revenues, and it's going to safeguard jobs within the county. Visit Buckinghamshire is a time-limited program uh, it's designed exclusively for businesses in this sector, and it has five separate work streams. I'm not going to do the detail on all of them because we're going to take you through that today. But we can boost your uh, green credentials. We can um, help you boost your accessibility, your digital skills, the support you can provide for your workforce and your growth. This support is easy to access and it's fully funded, but time limited. So it runs to June 2022. So this June, only however many months away, that's scary. <laughs> that's only four months away. Um, so if you're interested, please don't delay in, in applying. You can access a massive range of support. There'll be online training programs, carbon audits, accessibility audits, in-depth workshops, one-to-one -one advice from a team of experienced advisors, and inspirational events like this one. There's also going to be some vouchers available that will supplement uh, and, and help you support uh, to the new initiatives that, that we need you to get going on. So what's not to like about that program? And, and um, you've got nothing to lose, so I would really recommend taking up some of some of the support and um, hand over to us today before i do let's have another go um are you already investing time or budget into any of these areas so anybody already investing in green credentials accessibility digital skills developing your workforce or growth and diversification Accessibility in the birthplace of the Paralympics. Are we all brilliant at it? Oh my goodness. That's a real shocker. But every, everybody looking at um, ways to, to diversify and grow their business. And what are your, bar what are your barriers to investing? What are the barriers to you investing in any of these new trends, these new markets? Money. Time, knowledge. Okay. Well, enough from me. It's now time to hand over to Simon. I'm going to give him a couple of minutes to find his way over that lip. <laughs> Uh, to, to, to let him tease out for us the value of thinking about some of these things. Simon, um, as most of you will know, is a freelance UK travel journalist and broadcaster. 
He works for various news and travel publications, as well as being the travel correspondent for The Independent. And the bit I like, he won the 2011 Celebrity Mastermind. Uh, what, what was the specialist subject? It was Concord. Concord. Very good. <laughs> Simon, over to you. Hello, everybody here. Hello, everybody watching at home. We are watching you as well, by the way, so uh, be careful what you, you do out there. What an absolute pleasure and privilege it is to be here. Um, I, I can't thank you enough for the kind invitation to take part. And the only request I have is if I could possibly have the clicker back. Um, <laughs> that would be really, really convenient for the purposes of the, um, uh, the presentation. But, uh, but Thank you again. Uh, yes, I've got a terrible confession to make, which is that um, until I got the very kind invitation, I've been like so many people who live in London. I've gone through beautiful Buckinghamshire on the way to other places. I'd occasionally come out for a walk in the Chilterns, absolutely lovely, but I hadn't properly invested time and effort in seeing it. I've since been on 3.5 trips out here, and it's been Great. For the next 15 minutes exactly, I'm going to talk to you about the future, about what the opportunities are for you, bringing in some ideas from around the world and hopefully um, persuading you that this is actually a time of great opportunity for Buckinghamshire birthplace, as we heard of the Paralympics. And the story is just so brilliant. And it's also very well described on the County Council website um, uh, 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 of the origins of, of that. Um, now, for the first, last 25 years, I should explain that I spent my entire life, uh, up until the coronavirus pandemic, um, being on holiday pretending to work. Um, it's been absolutely great. There we are, drifting around Sydney Harbour, being massaged by lovely Nadine while talking nonsense to a, a BBC camera. It is a, a tough life. Oh, by the way, um, this isn't... Um, it isn't what you think it is. Um, I went to a uh, Visit Bedfordshire event. There was simply no atmosphere. <laughs> Sorry. Um, two years ago, that's where I was on a beautiful beach on the uh, Indian Ocean island of Socotra in the country of Yemen, a really silly place to be if there's a global pandemic. And there I was the week before last in um, beautiful Northern Ireland, not quite as warm and sunny. And in the meantime, I've just been, um, well, instead of being on holiday pretending to work, I've um, had to be at work pretending to be on holiday. Um, clearly, it's been um, uh, miserable, but I did get away. And Juliet Kinsman, the sustainability editor for uh, Condé Nast Traveller, is going to be very cross with me because I was last week out in Australia for the um, uh, reopening of Australia after the coronavirus pandemic, which was lovely. But I was very, very lonely. Um, Australia, the prime example, with possible exception of New Zealand, of how completely to destroy incoming Tourism. And then yesterday, back on the beat, this was the um, only tube train running in London. There we are. Um, so many great opportunities are awaiting um, Buckinghamshire. And largely, it's come from the negativity about travelling abroad. That's just a typical question um, that I got last year. This has become part of our... Anybody... Hand up. Absolute mess. Um, you're just filling out forms. You're hoping that you've got the right test. Um, you know that you're going to be wearing a mask all the way through your uh, journey. It's going to be miserable. And the fact that you've got perhaps a rewarding destination at the end of it, well, you are so exhausted from all the, uh, the confusion that you possibly think next time, um, let's stay somewhere a little closer. And uh, fortunately, um, Buckinghamshire is extremely close to the biggest travel market in uh, Europe, which of course is London. Um, and of course, what you need to do is try and convert the kind of people who are just coming out for a day trip into overnight stays. And it's going to get even easier to get to Buckinghamshire once Crossrail, which is three and a bit years late, uh, finally starts up because then at least the south of the county is going to be one change of train away from uh, hundreds of, of, of places. Now, there are some barriers to success as well, and I'm afraid they stem from Brexit. 
Uh, I know that Buckinghamshire was very narrowly, I think 52-48 in, in favour of uh, leaving the European Union. Well, one effect is absolutely critical for what is going to happen in terms of inbound tourism. And that is that um, already, and I've been talking to a lot of people working in inbound tourism, and they say, frankly, if the government had over the past two years set out completely to destroy inbound tourism, they couldn't have done any better. And furthermore, the decision last August to say that people with perfectly secure um, EU ID cards are not allowed to travel on them to the UK means that 300 million people are now excluded unless they queue up at their post office, pay 100 euros and get a passport to come to the UK when there's, I think, 37 countries they can go to without it. That is why international arrivals are empty. Um, meanwhile... <laughs> Uh, you are going to see that um, this was the absolute top uh, success story for English heritage, the, the castle at Barnard Castle. You are going to see that an awful lot of locations, in particular the cities, in particular um, places like, like Oxford, like Edinburgh, like York, like Chester, dependent on incoming tourism. Well, there aren't any incoming tourists, um, or at least the numbers are going to uh, remain extremely low so they are going to be going after the same domestic market that you are and this might well be their slogan um, we shall see uh, but it is mostly positive and you have got many many advantages um, and here we are this is why you should always um, not uh, go from keynote to uh, powerpoint anyway you know what I mean uh, experience is great and small that is what you do you're great at it and I've really enjoyed traveling around and just um, going to the museum in Buckingham, for example, um, seeing the great delights there. Just up the road from here, who, who is this? Would you like to shout out? David Bowie, of course. Um, lovely, lovely treat. In um, Amersham, uh, I, on one of my many missions here, um, suddenly I can't remember which particular travel disaster unfolded while I was on the uh, uh, underground coming out to Amersham, but something did. So I had to find somewhere to sit and work for very intensively for an hour. And this is the Metro Lounge just up from the station, an absolute joy to work at and a beautiful interior, very uh, individual, great food and drink, lovely service and great Wi-Fi, which we'll come on to. And my goodness me, uh, I had not, until I got the kind invitation to be here, um, visited Stowe, can you believe? Um, and I was absolutely uh, thrilled to be there. I haven't been to Wadston Manor. I told you I've been here 3.5 times. Well, I'm afraid the point five was um, Storm Eunice. Uh, that sort of stopped my progress at Harrow on the Hill. Um, wasn't, wasn't very good at all. And of course... Um, not only is Beaconsfield the home to the National Te Film and Television School, but Buckinghamshire, we were just hearing about the exp expansion of Pine we'll be just hearing about the James Bond experience. And of course, um, th there's stuff happening all the time. So Joachim Phoenix is currently over in West Wickham fil filming. He is, he is uh, Napoleon. Um, and it's a, a great time to be delivering joy and creating memories and just a couple of ideas about how you can do that so uh, this is the seafront at St Kilda in Melbourne where I was this time a week ago absolutely lovely perfectly nice beach but what if you just look down there um they've actually brought it to life very straightforward they just get a piece of art and they explain how this place looked uh, a century ago, and it just adds something to your trip. In the National, the State Library of Victoria, fantastic building if you ever go there, look, who doesn't want to go through a door with that on it? I just thought this was terrific. And increasingly around the world, I'm seeing particularly because everybody um, uh, is well almost everybody who's under a certain age is is uh, instagramming all the time just have a frame so that people can can uh get a really good sense of the art and the nature that is here of course you all know that you've got to help uh, particularly if you're an accommodation provider uh, solve people's problems in advance and that means making sure that they have access to uh, um Electricity, because we've all got 17 things that need to be charged these days. 
and either provide great Wi-Fi or don't. Um, and it's perfectly reasonable in some circumstances to say, we haven't got any Wi-Fi, we haven't got any television, talk to each other. Um, there we are. And, and increasingly many places are doing that. And that's a perfectly good uh, attitude to take. Um, we will be talking more and more about green tourism. And I welcome the great steps forward that uh, Bucky and Risha has. Um, of course, many of us didn't realize when we were hiking through the Chilterns that we were being green tourists, but uh, it's, it's very good that we, we were. Some examples of not green tourism, ladies and gentlemen, include this plane from British Airways, um, which is taking us to a better world. This was actually at Belfast Airport uh, a couple of weeks ago. And the idea that an airline is saying, yes, look, we're great, we're green, we're sustainable, when manifestly aviation is uh, a cause of many, uh, a significant amount of um, environmental impact, um, I think is a little bit uh, churlish. And I'm going to challenge you. So let's, uh, a number of you, of course, will be providing great food and drink experiences. Um, you, I might well come to your excellent premises and say, I'd love an orange juice. And I tell you what I would love you to say, you can't have one. And that would be because you recognize that um, even with global warming, uh, the citrus fruit is not yet being grown in large quantities in the Buckinghamshire area. And therefore, um, you might want to give me an apple juice instead. So actually diminishing choice for travelers can make your green credentials look better. And here's just a really nice idea. I was over in Berlin in October, fantastic city, staying at a, a, a perfectly nice hotel where they had a great twist, which was if you didn't have, have the linen change, have the, the cleaners into your room, you're obviously minimizing the impact. They would give you a free drink in their very nice bar. Thank you. As you can imagine, throughout my stay, I didn't have any room service at all. Um, of course, the, the great thing is that Buckinghamshire has got so much of this already. This is just the fantastic circular walk around Buckingham. If you haven't taken it, I strongly recommend it. And even in, um, in Aylesbury, there's plenty of options for cycling. So you don't need to set off on a great trans Buckinghamshire experience although of course long distance um, opportunities are available and the Thames path yes I know Buckinghamshire hasn't got a huge stretch of it but you have got a bit and it is uh, lovely in Marlow and by the way this is absolutely his, this is a really important point I did some serious research here and just there is some um, uh, the point where Buckinghamshire Oxfordshire and Berkshire all meet there we are um, and of course uh, it's terrific that Chiltern Railway, which for historical reasons is mostly having to run noisy old diesels around uh, the county, actually has now hybrid trains and they are doing uh, great things too. And just across the road from here, if you've driven your electric car, you would be able to play, park at um, one of the best provided electric vehicle charging points. And in beautiful Marlow, there are many, many shops, including some which are uh, focusing on their uh, green credentials. Um, we're going to be talking about uh, uh, digital skills. Well, you don't need really to have much more digital skill for some great tourism opportunities than to um, uh, have, have be able to write with chalk. So there we are. Um, that, that's going to tempt people in. Um, I, I think that will as well. And um, this, I'm afraid, was in Henley, wherever that is. So Bloody Mary is a red, Stilton is blue. It's nearly Valentine's Day. So are you giving a foodie gift too? It doesn't scan, but um, but there we are. You get the picture. And then uh, in Beaconsfield, I did find the uh, uh, the swan doing much the same. You need to be careful, though. Um, Jamie's Italian in Bath is now out of business. That might be because they put this very nice sign up. So you might think, oh, I'll go over here. In fact, Jamie's Italian is over here. So just try and, <laughs> try and pay attention. Um, now... If you are not on Instagram and Twitter um, and other platforms, then find a young person and get them to talk you through it. So it's a great uh, Buckinghamshire business, um, the Blue Dutch Barge, which has a very good uh, Instagram uh, 
account. They will do all sorts of things where just by um, on this single channel, you can do all manner of, of, uh, of bookings. You can get somebody a gift voucher and so on. It's very good. Even on Twitter, which I think is possibly just looking at the, the de demographic here, um, more, more, um, more popular. Um, I've stayed, I spent quite a lot of money at the Carey Arms because they suddenly came up just before a bank holiday and said, oh, we've still got some rooms available. So that's very good. And when I was at Stowe, and this shows that somebody's paying attention, uh, National Trust in, in, in Stowe uh, said, oh, uh, and I did pay my way, don't you worry. Um, but they said, um, he, he's around, I think it was a, a, a bit of a warning, really. But I did my Instagram live from their fine premises. And then there we are. Uh, the great thing about Twitter, of course, is that it is completely interactive and people will um, uh, be able to post their own uh, responses to it. Finally, before we get on to the um, really important uh, panel discussion, please be generous. Um, that is what people remember. This, ladies and gentlemen, is Didcot um, Railway Centre. You may or may not have been there. It's in Oxfordshire, wherever that is. But I happened to be there on Sunday, and um, due to operational difficulties, I was uh, there almost at the end. It cost £15 to get in. But because there was only half an hour left, he said, oh, come on, in you go. I'm going to remember that. I'm going to go back. I'm going to spend £15 there. I'm going to tell all my friends you should go there. They're really nice people. Unlike this beautiful um, old Victorian hotel, um, this is the Driver Arms on these in the Scottish borders. Absolutely lovely, except that I'm not sure generosity is their strong point. So um, uh, the, the first morning I came down to breakfast and um, uh, said... Uh, I, I like um, full Scottish breakfast, brown toast. It arrived and it was white toast. And I sort of said, being very English, I think I said brown toast. And the lady said, that's not what it says on my chitty. There we are. <laughs> um, and then that very evening, uh, my lovely wife had, often, uh, had, had um, the previous night, um, ordered a bottle of uh, wine. And since she's a very uh, uh, reasonable person, she hadn't drunk it all and left it for the following night. And they couldn't find it. So they brought another bottle, but they said, don't drink more than half of it. <laughs> so that is not quite, um, I, I think, going to encourage people to return. However, um, things such as this, this was in Fitzroy Garden in Melbourne um, a, a week ago, uh, lovely cafe, just uh, borrow a picnic uh, rug and off you go and enjoy it yourself. And just now, uh, the UAE Emirate of Ras al Khaimah is offering that to the Ukrainian tourists who are uh, unable to return home. And that, I think, the people of Ukraine and a lot of other places are going to remember. So um, you've had a really tough two years, I know. Um, it will get better. Um, you can, if you want to, follow me on Twitter. Um, but meanwhile, thank you very much for your time. And let's bring in the excellent panel, starting with Juliet Kinsman, who is the sustainability editor for Condé Nast Traveller. Uh, Ross Calladine, who's the um, head of business support for Visit England, but will also be talking about uh, accessibility. Oh, come on. <laughs> oh, no. Juliet's given up already. <laughs> um, we, we've got Steve Gardham, who you all, I'm sure, know as the director of uh, uh, the Roald Dahl Museum. And... <laughs> Anthony Cox, uh, who is not just an award-winning hotelier, um, uh, 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 and uh, director, executive director of Woodenhoe House. He is, of course, program manager for Visit Buckinghamshire Boost. There we are. Thank you very much. Oh. So um, we have uh, 40 minutes to run through this. We'll be clear. We're, we're running slightly behind, but uh, I'm sure that will be okay. Um, Juliet, <laughs> sustainability. Um, it's just something people say, isn't it? Well, you know, we haven't had the questions in advance. So I'm, <laughs> it's been a lot to process. First of all, let's get one thing out of the way. I don't even like the word sustainability. Okay. I don't like saying it. It's not, let's just, sustainability, everyone's just throwing it around. But what I like to think of is just simply positive impact. So anything, a business, a service that is doing more good, whether it's for the environment or for, for social, in terms of social impact, more than negative impact. 
Okay. Is that gonna, unhelpful? Well, I'm going to have to press you on that because you are the sustainability editor. Yep. It says here. Yeah. And first ever. Uh, and, and that's very good. But but is Condé Nast Traveller is the wider tourism industry doing this because they think it's really important, or are they doing it because they think that um, travellers think it's really important, or? Does actually nobody really care, but they think, oh, we better make it look as though we're doing something uh, and we're being thoughtful? All of the above. Oh, so okay. let, let's answer this in two ways. Okay. So one is, I don't know if you're aware that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, came out, uh, the latest report on Monday, and it did say that, you know, a lot of the damage done because of the climate emergency is irreversible. So let's have that front of mind. Okay. Seriously, the climate emergency is with us. It's looking us in the face and we have to do something about that. Sorry, buzzkill. Fact. Um, if we look at it from your perspective as a business or your, you know, in terms of uh, do you have to look at this from a commercial point of view as well as, you know, moral? Uh, yes, absolutely. So we know that Booking.com released a report in January which said 87% of UK consumers want to choose more sustainable trips and products. It's just um, that that's what they want to do. Skyscanner came out with a report which was launched at WTM last uh, year, which said the one barrier to that is they can't easily tell what the more sustainable or green product is. So when I saw all this, it was fascinating. Um, I also think accessibility is part of the sustainability conversation. When I see the barrier is money and time, I just have to say to you, if you want to future-proof your business, you have to to invest a little bit of time now. And as for the money part, being a more sustainable, efficient business will save you money in the long run. Now, sustainability is hugely complex. And I, you know, obviously I hope to give you some ideas and tips so you can make your business more sustainable so it converts into customers. But yeah, does that help a bit? It does. I think we'll come back to you about one or two of those <laughs> points. But um, uh, let, let's uh, now talk to Ross Caladine. Um, now, First of all, I'd love if you could just a quick overview of uh, you're, you're in charge of business support. Um, I imagine you've had your work cut out over the last couple of years. Yeah, it's been a bit of a trying time for all tourism businesses uh, across the country. Really tough two years. We've been trying our hardest to funnel as much guidance and support to operators on the ground through the DMOs like Visit Bucks, uh, so supporting them. And hopefully we're entering a much brighter phase now. Um, we're seeing domestic tourism forward bookings look, look quite strong. As you say, cities uh, are in need of our support in particular at the moment uh, they, because of their reliance on inbound. Inbound is going to obviously take longer to build back. Uh, but two weeks ago, we Visit Britain launched the international marketing campaign in the US and in the European market. So we're out there with lots of other countries vying for the first international tourists. And we want their first trip to be to be back in Britain. But dom domestic first, I think, building back. Right. Well, could I possibly press you on the two reasons why people might not be making Britain their first choice for an, uh, an overseas trip, which would be the very, very complex and difficult and expensive rules that the UK has had in for the vast majority of the past two years, and the ID card issue? Yeah, I think the ID card issue is going to particularly hit the schools. Um, and we're, we're seeing that insight and research come through at, at, at the moment. Look, we, you know, we have to work as a National Tourist Board within, you know, the boundaries that have been, been placed on, on tourism uh, and the challenges. And we're just going to be redoubling our efforts to try and win visitors back and, and, and show how Britain is a welcoming and a fantastic. I mean, our latest campaign is see another side of Britain. Uh, and I think what our research shows us is that a lot of international visitors have done London. They've done Britain. We want to give them another reason post COVID to come back and see some, some different elements. And hopefully that means coming out into fantastic counties like Bucks. Thank you. Um, so, well, Steve and, and, and Anthony, both in the front line. Um, Steve, first, uh, can you just give us a, a, a snapshot of what it's been like running a top museum at a time when nobody can go to top museums or indeed mediocre museums? It's been challenging. I mean, I'm conscious of the, the expression that, that people have used about the, the, the common experience of the pandemic. We've not necessarily all been in the same boat, but we have all been on the same see buffeted by very, very um, familiar waves. And I think that's true for us. So we took a decision. We're a small site. And we took a decision that the best thing that we could do was furlough basically everybody. And furlough grants really made the difference. Um, we had 
quite a lot of money reserved because we had been planning to do a big capital project to address various issues about you know our green our greenness our accessibility um it regenerate our core asset our site for the future we've obviously had to dip into those reserves to keep going um we reopened in that brief period in the autumn of 2020 with a, a completely un uneconomic un unviable uh economically um, visitor offer. But it was a really interesting experience, experiment and experience for our staff. So we ran really, really low volume, but really, really high quality guided visits to the museum. And the response was fantastic. We knew it wasn't gonna work, you know, uh, financially, we knew that, but it gave our staff a focus, it kept us visible. And I think it was a really big part of getting through it. And I think the things that have happened during the, the past couple of years that have been good for us, just the, you know, the adoption of, of technology. So a meeting at the museum now is typically online. Now, some of the staff might be sat a few, a few metres away from each other. Other colleagues are at home. But in a small site where you don't even necessarily have a meeting room, but you need to have conversations to develop your business, that kind of stuff really helps. Um, we're open. We've just had a decent half term. We're not all the way back recovered. But I feel encouraged and positive about how we'll get on in the year ahead and next year. It sounds as though you've got one or two kind of takeaways from this horrible, horrible pandemic where you will actually be changing things for the better um, for both the visitor experience and for your business. I think so, yeah. But there is, a, there is a limit to what we can change because of the nature of um, our content, the, the, the subject matter. It attracts a family audience, obviously, and it attracts a school audience. And we're really pleased to see that schools are coming back. Perhaps we'll talk about this a bit more later on, but one of the things that we've done is we've seized the opportunity to develop an online version of our schools offer. Mm -hmm. um, and that wasn't a, a rapid pivot to lockdown learning. It was seeing something that could be for, you know, we've got a big name and a small site, which was pretty much full with school visits before the pandemic. And we hope to be full again. How do we scale that? Well, the opportunity for us is definitely online for a particular market. Thank you for that, Steve. Um, so, Anthony, well, the idea of virtual visits to um, great museums um, isn't particularly good if you are um, a hotelier, I imagine. Um, do you want to talk through the experience for your business, for you and for your excellent staff over the past two years and sort of tell us where you are now? Yes, yeah, certainly. I, I've been working with a number of businesses on the south coast predominantly over the last two years and helping them really support them through the pandemic. And I think... Uh, one of the main considerations, and obviously we'll be talking about this a little bit later on, I don't think was, there's been enough thought around that future workforce. Mm -hmm. At the moment, there's 400,000 vacancies in this country in hospitality, leisure and tourism, and London's not even open. Yeah. So once London opens, that's just only going to go one way. One of the trends I saw when I was working with these businesses, we were actually seeing hospitality employees from London apply to our businesses on the periphery for the first time. And the conversations we were having are, are we going to keep them when London reopens? Will they gravitate back? Because particularly in hotels and restaurants, London's the epicentre in this country and Edinburgh the same in Scotland. So seeing that workforce move out of the city, come into the regional areas. Um, and I think the, the businesses that did well last summer, because let's face it, every hotel in the countryside by the coast was about 99% mm. full. The businesses that did well are the businesses which were forward thinking as yourself did, used the furlough scheme to its absolute maximum and retained as many people as possible. And it did shock me how many operators I saw out there with quite sizable names in the industry who let a lot of people go through redundancy. So I think that workforce piece, absolutely critical because you haven't got the people to deliver it, you're not going to grow your turnover. Sure. Well, workforce is one of the very important uh, elements of this. And how do you address that, for goodness sake, when... Um, clearly, the, the UK government view is we're not going to um, return to, to uh, uh, opening borders to, to workers from, from the European Union. Um, and you simply have to develop um, uh, local workers, which to, uh, I'm interested, and uh, maybe this is one for Steve as well, the extent to which that has been possible um, and whether you think that actually... It is achievable to overcome that uh, deficit, or whether you think there will have to be um, change in government, or quite possibly both. Um, so, you want to give in that? Or? Well, it's really important to, to say the Roald Dahl Museum and Story Centre is, is a non profit charity. So, growing our turnover is about getting back to even, you know, getting back to break even. 
Um, we have had staff turnover, often for positive reasons. A colleague of mine now works here at the uh, Warsaw Theatre, which is great. But if you've got a small staff and an SME and one, one member of staff leaves, that's a, a large percentage of your workforce. And you might have a gap. And those gaps in recruitment are, it, recruitment feels more sluggish. And I think within our sector, within the museum sector, what we offer um, to employees isn't bad, but we're in a rural location. And what we're all seeing at petrol pumps at the moment, um, and it was happening before the crisis in Ukraine, um, is the cost of travel is rising mm. and the, the cost of commuting is therefore going up. And that's a real challenge for us. Yes, we're on the train line, but train services aren't famously cheap in this country. Um, so it's a challenge. We have shut our cafe and I do not expect to reopen it. Now, that's not just a staffing issue. Staffing is a big part of that. We lost a, a long serving member of staff. And we haven't been able to replace them. Um, it's also not a very economically viable cafe because of the, the challenges of the, the size of our site. Actually, part of me feels quite good about that. I'm disappointed because we were moving in the right direction in terms of a really, really locally focused offer. But in terms of the, the business sense of it, it's not a bad thing for us. The next challenge now is to go, well, OK, well, how can we provide catering? Are we a big enough venue to have commercial pop-ups happening? Do we need to find some kind of a hybrid thing? We're only at the start of that journey, but it's a particular example where a museum cafe seems like a no-brainer. Actually, for us, it's not possible and doesn't look yeah. like it's going to be possible. Okay, uh, th thank you for that. Um, Ross, I mean, what, what can you offer in the way of business support or encouragement um, in terms of meeting the workforce problem, uh, along with all the issues of this being largely a rural county um, with, with um, limited uh, transport? What, what can you say to cheer everybody up? Oh, I think what's become clear is that tourism is now competing with other sectors of the economy. Yeah. Um, and there's been a massive shift to flexibility and recognising the, the requests from our, you know, our employees on flexible working. Uh, employees in our industry need to do everything that they can to listen to uh, the, the people that they're trying to recruit because unless they're able to provide flexible working uh, and all those other benefits that some of the other sectors are, are, are hot on now, we will get left behind and it will continue to be a, a very difficult recruitment environment. So we saw some people, for example, switch out of hospitality and tourism and go and work in an Amazon warehouse because the terms, the flexibility, you know, during COVID, not everyone was, not every customer was kind and sympathetic, mm. you know, and people were, you know, were sometimes going to work and, and, and getting shouted at. So, you know, for them to go into a dark warehouse, that became quite an attractive option. What we need to now do is make the benefits of working in a tourism and hospitality business outweigh working in a dark and dreary, no window uh, 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 warehouse. And I think we can do that as an industry. I think, you know, we've got a huge amount of benefits to offer um, the employees and attract them back into this sector and retain them. Once we've attracted them, you know, retention is, is, is really the key. It's a lot easier to retain an employee, as we all know, than to actually attract a new employee into a role. Okay, thank you for that. So we, we've looked at um, the, the supply of the tourism product and the, uh, the impediments to that. Let's look at the demand for it. And Julia, I'm really interested. You've been covering travel for some time and how have consumer tastes changed and how much appetite is there, particularly among the core Condé Nast readership, which actually is in London and South East England, um, for saying, yeah, Barcelona, we're not going there, Berlin, we're not going there, um, let's go to beautiful Buckinghamshire. Thank you. Yes, I've been a journalist for, I think, 28 years. Um, I've only, I'm Connie Nuss's first sustainability editor, that's been the last year, but I'm still freelance. I was founder of Mr and Mrs Smith, if you're familiar with that, back in... 20 years ago, uh, 2002, we came up with that idea. So very much it's the boutique, the niche luxury traveler that I understand. Um, and I think it's important to acknowledge that niche. So if we're talking, if we break down travel into lots of different niches, that's, um, that's become more segmented, I think we'll agree. So people are much more, you know, they may really be passionate about food or, or certain things. So it's speaking to the right customer. It's looking at your audience not trying to be all things to all people. Um, and I would say what have I seen change is that, uh, well, particularly in the last two years, it's part of the sustainability conversation, but it's, it's really that people want authentic 
uh, high quality experiences and products. And they really, really want to taste and get a sense of where they are. And they want stories from where they are. So in the context of Buckinghamshire, I have to say I haven't been back to Ellsbury since I did my 12 plus here in the 80s. Um, I went to Dr. Challoner's. So I'm also, I can tell you that I don't think I ever really re received press releases about Bucks, and I don't think of it as a, as a destination, I'm sorry to say. I went to Waterston, it's correcting that. But there are so many stories in Buckinghamshire, so why am I not getting those stories fed to me? Um, and, you know, it's really important with storytelling because you might not feel like storytellers, but you should as a business, and you need to work out who you're telling your stories to, how you're going to make them feel, and if it's whether you're a national trust property or whether you're providing food and drink, it's really engaging them with information that makes them feel something. So there are so many, so many reasons to spend time in Buckinghamshire and spend more money in Buckinghamshire. You just have to communicate that in a slightly more, yeah, uh, emotional way and certainly visually. I just had a quick look across everything. You really, if you think about your branding, again, who are you talking to? What's going to engage with them? The images you share, the way you talk about it. You could elevate a lot of your, if you don't mind me saying, the stories could be just pitched a little bit higher. We want less people coming, spending more money. That's the goal, right? Well, Not I'm less sorry. overall, but I mean, it's better to have less people coming, but spending much more money than mass tourism is what I mean. Yes, I mean, I, 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 I'm, I, I'm perhaps speaking out of turn here, but I think mass tourism um, is a problem that um, a lot of places, possibly including Buckinghamshire, would quite like to have. <laughs> um, but we, we, we shall see about that. But, but you were just saying about you know, telling, telling you stories. Is that you as a journalist so that you can interpret them and communicate them, or is that you as a person? As a human being. I went to Waterston. I love that. Is it? I can't even remember the app you download. It wasn't working because the house itself isn't open, but I love the idea of that. People, okay, uh, storytelling connects with a different part of our brain. And this is really relevant to the sustainability uh, conversation, again, because it's not just about stats. It's not about solar panels. It's, it's really these human stories. And for me, if I hear a brand or a business has really looked after its staff. I get that feeling from the people there. Talent is a huge crisis right now. Invest in people because they tell your stories. They're on the front line. They make you feel something. They're, you go away feeling something. Hospitality is a people business. It's not just about product and hardware and real estate, you know, and we have to remember that. Um, it, is, it is people we connect with. The word in Greek, philoxenia, uh, uh, hospitality, is kindness of strangers. So my strongest travel memories are, are well, actually, when I went to Waterston, it does look really nice, and I love the gardens, and it's beautiful. But, you know, it's how it makes me feel and, and finding out the story. So please, you know, um, yeah, it, it, it's the people. It's the people. Thank you for that. Let, let's move on and look more in more detail at accessibility. Now, clearly, of course, birthplace of the Paralympics, Clearly, and this is one for you, Ross, we are living in a, a time of demographic change where there are increasingly going to be more uh, elderly travellers um, with mobility issues, with hearing issues, with, with uh, uh, sight issues and so on. Um, you uh, can tell us what, what the overall picture is like in terms of how well the industry is addressing accessibility, I hope. Uh, yeah. Thank goodness for that. <laughs> it, it's patchy at the moment. Um, you know, some great gems across the country when it comes to accessible places to visit. Um, what we've got to remember is that during the pandemic, uh, disabled people were hardest hit. Um, but like everyone else, you know, people with different access requirements want to get out there and have great holiday experiences again and keep people uh, you know, set central to it, keep, that, keep them in mind. They might have some practical requirements that can make their stay or their visit easier, but always retain the fact that they're looking for a fantastic tourism experience like, it, like everyone else. Um, Pre-pandemic, the accessible tourism market in England alone was worth over 15 billion pounds a year. So it's not a niche in that sense. You know, one in, at least one in five of us has some form of accessibility requirement. Um, and hopefully, uh, through conversations with uh, tourism businesses today, we can help to give some practical tips and real ways that you can improve the accessibility and therefore the appeal of your business. Okay, well, Anthony, I'm, I'm on the hospitality front, are, are hotels um, doing enough in terms of accessibility? Or is it a question of, oh, yeah, well, we've got one accessible room. Oh, sorry, it's booked. Um, and um, by the way, we haven't quite got the ramps and um, lifts that you might expect. Yeah, I'm afraid to say they're not doing enough. And um, I think it, um, 
it shows when you look at the accessible tourism venues available on Visit England even, I was really surprised at how little businesses are engaged promoting accessibility through the national, you know, the tourism scheme. So I think, and we also saw on the, on the Slido earlier, it seems to be quite low on people's um, radar, but I have a very good friend, another hotelier, who um, many years ago was struck down with an illness, and um, he, he has now had lived experience. He builds new hotels, and he is now designing in um, as part of the build, which is easier to do on a new build, we all know that, but he is considering accessibility as a key part of his developments for hotels and new build hotels. But you can do that with existing businesses as well. well. Well, let's just pick up on that point. I mean, clearly accessibility costs money at a time when every business here will know that, that um, uh, they, they are very short of, of capital. And can you actually tell us that there is a return to be had on investing additionally in accessibility? Most definitely, most definitely. And it's going to grow. It's going to grow. I'm sure Ross would, would chime in with me on that. It's going to grow. Um, people, as Juliet's saying, they're seeking experiences. They may not be able to travel great distances. So experiences on your doorstep, they're easy to access. So I think in terms of that whole space, you can show a return on investment. Um, by adapting your premises if, if, you, if you need to make adaptations, or if you're designing something new or introducing a new product, design it in as part of the process. Consider accessibility as part of that, that new development. Um, I, I'm interested in anybody who might want to chip in on this. Clearly, people need to get to uh, those locations and get to fantastic uh, uh, attractions such as the Royal Dahl Museum. Um, is, is, are the transport providers doing enough? legislation is really catching up on transport. Uh, so there was legislation by 2020 for the train network and the bus network. So all new stock has to be accessible. Um, so I think internationally, you know, we really are up there now with our public um, transport infrastructure. If you look at the Hackney carriage in London, for example, we're almost unique that we have a capital city where almost all of its taxi stock, okay, not, not, not the uh, non non uh, hackney carriages but the hackney carriages are fully accessible you know for wheelchair users they all have inbuilt ramps uh, they all have hearing loops they all have visual contrast so i think we can do ourselves down because we have high standards in, in britain when it comes to equality and accessibility and quite rightly so but still when you compare us internationally we're leading and i think for bucks to have this fantastic usp as the birthplace of the paralympics you know there is so much that you can do around that and, and it's just waiting, you know, that potential is just waiting to be realised. And what we need is, is, is far more tourism providers across the whole of the county responding to the opportunity here, the business case, because this isn't just a social imperative. Um, we've, we've spoken about uh, the, the, the money that you can put into your pockets as, as business operators. And then as a destination, I think Bucks can really put itself front, front and centre for accessible tourism. Um, Ju Juliet, um, you've been to probably more countries than the rest of us put together. How would you say the UK fares in terms of accessibility compared with perhaps you know, bigger economies like the, like the US or indeed um, uh, bigger tourist economies like Spain and France? It's a topic close to my heart and it's very much part of the sustainability. I don't think I can answer that, but I can speak to the UK. Um, what I can say in terms of, and, and just to amplify that point, that one in five people is either significantly mentally or physically impaired. Um, I do think that we provide a certain amount of um, facilities, but what we still need to do, and this is where we're great, uh, we did it with sustainability, we can do it with accessibility, is sex it up you know, really show that some of those hotel rooms which are kitted out to people of different uh, needs are beautiful. They're not just the rubbish rooms put in the basement. And I've stayed in some hotels where, you know, they have all the, the, the kit, but they're, they're design conscious. And so it's changing how, um, it, I can't compare. I have a, I have a godson who, who has disabilities and I have friends um, who ask me for tips. Um, I think Exactly as you say, it's been legislated. It's the product is there. Or the, we just need it's the way we talk about it. And I was devastated to see such a you know one in five people. That's our families, you know, to see it at the bottom there. Accessibility is part of the green conversation. Don't be distracted by green. Okay, green as human beings also. 
I, think okay. I just come in there, yeah. hand, Simon, just to say uh, it's a harrowing statistic. Each one of us will be disabled on average for eight years in our lifetime. So, you know, we might not have personal incidents of disability ourselves or in our families right now, but many of people wanting to come and stay at your businesses and visit your venues do have these access requirements. Now, they might not uh, call themselves disabled or relate with that language, which is why on your website, you know, you want to be speaking broadly about you know access for all and what you can provide for not just wheelchair users which are only nine percent of disabled people use a wheelchair mm. think much more about people with hearing loss mm. kids with autism uh people with dementia want to you know be brought out with their with their family members to come and experience your great attraction so i would say think very broadly and start a conversation i know buds is the local access group in, in bucks i'm sure they'd be delighted through the boost program to come and talk to you with people with lived experience and look at your venue with a helpful helpful ear and a helpful eye and, and give some tips. Okay. Um, don't forget, of course, that you will be able to, after the coffee break, which will be coming home, and if you're watching, coming soon, if you're watching at home, you will be able to go and make yourself a cup of coffee. Um, uh, Steve, can I just ask, there you are, with a, a, a great museum, but with a small staff with limited budgets, um, how how well do you think you do and how much more do you think you can do? I think, I think the nature of my job is to be fiercely proud of all that we do and always be totally dissatisfied wanting to do better. Um, so we, I think we do a minimum. Um, we have hearing aid loops. We have, you know, uh, although the museum, the it's a grade two listed site, 17th century coaching in, the, the museum build was done in 2005. So relatively speaking a lot of access issues were considered but that's now getting on for 20 years ago so mm -hmm. i don't think it's likely to be good enough i think that point about um having your accessibility reviewed is so important i don't know how good it is because i don't have impairments mm -hmm. you know i don't consider myself to be disabled i know that that's a gap everything's been disrupted over the last couple of years but we're actually taking part in a in a museum sector program, not dissimilar, I think, in, in, in spirit and concept to, to the Buckinghamshire Boost, which is forcing us to look at issues of equity, diversity, and inclusivity, which obviously includes access in all ways. We want to do more. The nature of our site is that, as I mentioned earlier, we're working towards a capital regeneration. Because it's a small site, it's very difficult for us to close a bit of it to install a changing places toilet or something like that and stay open and viable. Yeah. So for us, it's eggs in one basket when it comes to capital improvements. Yeah. But that's very much on our agenda for the next two, three years. Thank you for that. Um, I, I know that everybody, especially me, wants a cup of tea. Um, uh, but I, we need to spin around and just do digital skills. So I need to ask each of you, starting with Juliet, um, what social media do you predominantly consume and what do you use professionally? I was thinking about that when you mentioned it earlier and you were trying to sort of read the audience and what they probably did. You have to look at what you're talking about and you're sharing and, and match it. So I am Insta I'm on Instagram. I shared a post about best facts from Bucks yesterday. I, I like to follow my rule of edutain, which is to educate whilst uh, entertaining. I loved the pancake flipping one. I didn't know that. Um, so it, that part, part of the storytelling. So that Instagram is very visual. I use beautiful images. Um, I, I do have to say, whilst I'm not thinking any of us are a TikTok are we? I don't know. It's massive. It's really influential. I work on. I work on. A, just, just, just to uh, break in. Are you there. on TikTok? I'm on TikTok because oh, right. my social media manager, who happens to be my 21 year old daughter, said, "Dad, you've got to be on TikTok." So, okay, well, great. I'm actually working on a, on a tech startup, and I, I'm not plugging it for any reason other than you will if you're a hotel love it. It's called Weaver. It will provide a tool that will read your sustainability. So I'm, I'm auditing how do we share this tool? How do we get people to understand about sustainability? And again, it's about storytelling. How do those story, stories land with people and influ, influence behavioral change? That's all I care about, right? Um, TikTok is really powerful. I don't, I'm still, I don't even have it on my phone. It's because it's Chinese owned. I don't even want to go there. But um, it's, it's really powerful. Uh, I'll tell you some other facts, though. I'll tell you that Gen Z, the next generation, they really do love short-form films, which we see. They do also like quality long-form. Um, they really, really... You don't have to generate the content yourself. You can be sharing things relevant, uh, act as a curator. So they really enjoy that. So that could be Twitter. Um, it depends. It depends on your audience. But Luxury likes Instagram. 
Uh, Steve, can we go to you? Um, you clearly need to um, use, uh, well, first of all, what do you consume? And secondly, you know, how do you market using social media? Um, I confess that I have tried to reduce my social media use because of all the, you know, the, the well-being challenges that I think so many people have suffered, you know, in modern life, but certainly exacerbated by the, the, the disruptions and challenges of the last two years. So I've really tried to pare down my own personal social media use, but I see the importance of it. And I have to say, well, <laughs> I know it's what they say that you shouldn't do, which is be on your phones before you go to sleep, but my wife and I will laugh our heads off at TikTok videos and marvel at the genius and the wit that people put into that. So I recognize the value of that. We are between marketing teams at the moment. So um, one of the challenges, staff, Got a member of staff come back from maternity leave. Thank goodness, she's amazing. And happily, we're in a position to add a colleague. So suddenly, for a small to medium enterprise, our marketing strategy in a couple of months is going to be, you know, two hundred percent, you know, what it is at the moment. And I'm very excited about where we're going to go in future. In the development of that online school offer that I mentioned earlier, within my staff, digital storytelling skills have had a real boost through the pandemic. And I know, I'm hardly saying anything original, but I know how important video is going to be for us. I'll give you one very small example. In the pandemic, we recruited new trustees. We're a charity of board of trustees governing the organization. I did a short video talking about the opportunity that went on Twitter. Most viewed tweet I've ever done, 2000 saw it. And we had an incredibly strong and diverse group of trustee candidates. Loads of people who never been a trustee before. And if you extrapolate that to any kind of recruitment, I think there's a, I think there's a lesson there. Thank you, um, Anthony. Uh, I haven't seen you on TikTok. Um, yeah, my teenage sons are though, so it won't be long. So I right. won't be okay. long. Okay. So, so, what do you consume, or what do you use professionally? So, um, I was a Twitter user. I don't use it as much as I used to. I think there's, um, for, for me, I've been involved in some businesses recently where they're actually switching off some of their social media channels. They've actually switched off Twitter. Right. Um, and, and sorry, can you just tell us why that is? Simply, it wasn't um, that the, there was no... The, engagement, the really, Simon. I think it's about engagement. I think it's about the audience you want. Uh, Juliet touched on Instagram. Um, for me, in the, in the travel, leisure, tourism space, that for me is a very powerful... And we'll come on to it later on about a channel of distributing your product. Instagram is huge um, in this space. And I think people have moved from Twitter to Instagram. For the visuals, really, Simon, and the storytelling, just going back to storytelling. So um, I am a, a lapsed user of Twitter. I use it occasionally. <laughs> um, and then coming back to sort of recruitment piece now, LinkedIn, um, finding talent. Um, the days of going to a recruitment agency and paying thousands of pounds um, for your next food and beverage manager or general manager or marketing director, that sort of social media through finding talent. So LinkedIn had a great deal of success through LinkedIn um, and engaging with people on that platform for recruitment. Thank you very much. And finally, Ross. Um, so are you a recovering um, Twitter user? Well, what's, your, what's your status and what, what do you do professionally? So I'm just about a millennial, just. Um, so I was brought up with Facebook personally. I'm still on Facebook. I still suffer for some of the addiction uh, at night to feel you need to catch up on it, which is an awful, an awful thing. Um, Twitter I use for work, um, but it's something that I feel I can never be across. So you have to live with that. And you, I just dip in and out of Twitter. And whenever I dip in, I find some useful things from the people that I'm connected to. So I'm learning when I do, but I don't regularly use Twitter. Um, big thing for the audience is we've just relaunched our digital marketing toolkit for, for all tourism businesses across England. And the key thing that I think you've both said here is knowing your target audience and what platforms they use. So the message here is not to feel you need to have a presence on all of these social platforms. Know your audience, know where they're playing because uh, Gen Z are not playing on Facebook. Um, so you would not invest in paid ads on Facebook if you wanted that younger, that younger generation. Um, and just finally, I'll always bring it back to accessibility. Groups are massive on Facebook. So there's one that I'm on, uh, Accessible Holidays and Day Trips, has over 18,000 members. And the sharing um, that goes on between parents with kids with disabilities is massive. So what a loyal market. You know, I see great... Um, tourism experience has been shared on there and word of mouth in, in that uh, market is huge. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much, Luke. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you, Steve. Um, thank you, Juliet. Um, it's been uh, very edutaining. Is that 
uh, but there's more edutainment to come up um, after in 20 minutes time after our much needed wellness break thank you so much to our fantastic panel and thank you for watching
on this break, welcome back. Uh, we have our fantastic panel here, uh, Juliet Kinsman, Ross Caladine, Steve Gardham and Anthony Cox. And it's your turn to ask them some great questions now. If you're watching at home, then you should be able to get onto Slido. Of course, um, that we were talking of, there was some talk of the uh, QR code for Instagram appearing on there. If it does, then scan it and join in. So we've got roving mics in the room. I've also got some questions on Slido. Do we have um, a first first bidder for a question here? If not, then let's, uh, let's pick up the first one on Slido, which is, um, and this is uh, from Anonymous. I promise it's not my imaginary friend. Um, <laughs> as an accommodation provider, what can we do to encourage more visitors to stay in Buckinghamshire in 2022? Of course, great day trip destination, particularly for people from London, but how do you get them to stay overnight? Anthony, it's your job, isn't it? It is my job. It's a perennial problem. When I was running a hotel in Buckinghamshire, I ran a hotel in Bucks for six years, and the proximity to London, it's a bit of a double-edged sword. You know, it's easy access, easy to get out, but then people will arrive on a Saturday morning and go on a Sunday after breakfast, so you kind of have, a, and you have that one-night stay. So I think my best advice really is work with the destination management organisation, Visit Bucks, that's what they're channeled to do. That's what that presence is all about. It's about promoting the destination and promoting the businesses within that destination to extend the stay and enjoy other things while you're here. Um, is, is cooperation a part of this? I'm thinking whether or not Steve, um, for example, could, could come in with hotels and for some kind of package which is going to be more substantial, more meaningful, uh, more lucrative than um, just standard day trip. Yeah, I think that's got to be the way it goes. Cooperation is definitely part of it because it's about connecting parts of the, the tourist offer over a, over a range of miles. So, you know, Great Missenden, where the Royal Dark Museum is, is, is in the Misbourne Valley. And so you've got um, you've got Old Amersham, you've got Wendover, you've got different destinations in that valley that we need to connect up to justify staying not just one night, but perhaps two. Um, so I think cooperation is critical. Um. Another question coming in from the uh, uh, gentleman there, and I think that's David Stops, but please tell us who you are and who you represent. Is this working? Oh, it is working. Yes, thank you very much, Simon. Yes, you're absolutely right, it's David Stops. Uh, my wife and I here created the uh, David Bowie statue, Earthly Messenger. It took us two years to do it. Um, uh, and as you probably know, we're involved with music generally in the town. Um, and we were just saying that we both saw Jimi Hendrix back in the day, and I certainly did that. And I was actually in the dressing room with Bowie when he formed the Spiders from Mars in Aylesbury. So, yes, all good fun. Um, I just wanted to talk about music tourism because uh, the statue is the, still the only statue in the world of David Bowie. I thought by now there'd probably be about six, but we're still the only statue in the world, and people do come from all over the world to see it. Um, but I've got other ideas. Uh, one idea is to um, have a busking festival in Aylesbury. I don't know if you know, there's one in Ferrara in Italy, a fantastic busking festival. It's the world's biggest. It happens every August. And it'd be fantastic to have one in, in the UK. And that's my next idea. But I just wondered if I could ask the panel what they think of music tourism and how valuable that might be. Thank you very much. Um, obviously, the I guess the the one location, and uh, Ross, maybe you can help with this, um, is Liverpool, which uh, has completely cornered the market, hasn't it? Or is there is there more music tourism that we're unaware of? Uh, yeah, uh, are we on? Yeah, Strawberry Fields is is built a fantastic uh, attraction. Uh, you know, based around uh, the whole music experience there. So, I think that's evident that you know you can really produce something that has a big international pull. Um, so how you build the product around that, and going back to what we've just spoke about in the last question, is kind of partnerships, really. You know, you, you have a grain of something that is going to generate interest and visits from uh, you know, a certain segment of the audience. How do you connect them into great places to stay, other, other things to see and do to visit, to really make uh, you know, a visit stack up worthwhile so that it's more than just coming to see, you know, that one cent central attraction and, and build a trip out of it. Thank you. Uh, Julia, are there any great music attractions that you have been to? 
Well, I'm ashamed to say, well, I was a music journalist for 10 years before I was travel. I don't know if you knew that. <laughs> and I can't answer that necessarily. I do know loads of DJs and bucks. Um, uh, and let's not forget Stages Nightclub in Chesham, if that's still. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> Crikey. Um, I'm trying to think, uh, in, in all seriousness, I do know lots of people in the music industry who, who are based in Bucks. And actually, I'm going to take your, co your cooperation or, or, or co you know, word and, and, and raise you to a co-op petition and co-opportunity. And I think that's what we really need in the future of tourism is lots of different people working together to, exactly as you say, create these packages. There are so many music industry people based in Bucks, just probably because of the location close to London. Um, I went to a festival last year uh, where, you know, I'm just trying to think, you know, people really love these events. But again, I would look at how can you bring less people and charge them more? It's these much more targeted niche events uh, and, and music. It's, it's if you can offer something, the actual definition of luxury is rare. If you can offer them access to these great music people and somehow these very exclusive events and just think more creatively uh that's why people that's then it, you know it's a great thing i'm just popping out to bucks for this weekend music festival where i get to hear whoever it is you know it's these intimate luxurious uh experiences that i think make uh, you know make sense in terms of uh, finances uh thank you very much just uh, to round off on the uh, Jimi hendrix note there's at least two statues uh, worldwide and one in um the Isle of Wight, where he paid his last big performance, and of course, one in his birthplace of Seattle, neither of which is in Buckinghamshire. So let's move on. Um, Daniel Atkinson has a, 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 an online question for us. Um, Juliet touched on the sights, tastes that make a visit. Bucks is home to superb produce and venues. How could the county make itself a more experiential destination? Well, since Juliet, he mentions you. Um, do you want to have a stab at that? I'm so sorry. Ask me again. <laughs> exactly. Um, how do you make? I was talking uh, about Jimi Hendrix. And I was oh, okay. <laughs> um, right. Um, how do, how would you make? How could Bucks make itself a more experiential destination? Um, perhaps uh, with, without a uh, Jimi Hendrix element. Although all along the Watchtower would be an interesting concept. I don't know if anyone have you been to the Jimi Hendrix? Uh, it's a permanent exhibition on Brook Street in Mayfair. It's very cool. It's above where Handel actually lived, and they've. I love these very interactive experiences. It's not a museum. It's just something that is, it, it plays to all your senses. And I think all of us want to get more out of the time that we do spend when we're away. So I'm just, it's hard to imagine. I'm, I'll be honest with you as a luxury and, and sustainable luxury expert, there's not enough uh, hotel product in Buckinghamshire. And there's certainly not enough around e so there's a real opportunity and that ties into me you can you can tie that into whatever it is if f and b music all of these things it's just looking how can we get somewhere someone somewhere uh i just went to birch in hertfordshire last weekend it was 200 pounds a night for a very average hotel room okay but then they up up it by giving you all these like pottery casts or whatever it's the same thing whether it's music whether it's food it's taking a sort of average hotel product and really, really enhancing that, if that makes sense. I, I'm sure there's loads you can do. Um, all the storytelling or, or, you know, whether, it, whether it's linking Hendrix to Bucks, I don't know. It's the storytelling around that and bringing in these experts and privileged. I, I'm repeating myself, but no. helpful. Well, that's, that's great. So Anthony needs to repost about um, uh, the, the lack of um, a great hotel supply in Buckinghamshire and the microphone's on its way to you. Um, I think I'm still on this. Oh, okay, good. Okay. Right. Um, Interesting you went to Birch, Juliet. That's been on my radar for a long time. Thank you. But it's interesting because I remember that venue being a rather dowdy three-star conference centre. Right, okay. <laughs> um, but that is a, you know, a great example of, um, of uh, repurposing or repositioning your product. Um, and, you know, yes, there's not enough ho hotel product in Bucks, I don't think there's a not, not enough in the UK, to be honest, outside of London. And what we are seeing now is some investment coming through. People see the UK as a good long-term bet, particularly for the staycation market, which I don't think is a flash in the pan. I think elements of that is going to stay. So I'm seeing lots of investor appetite for taking on these assets and actually repositioning them. Hard Rock Hotel in London is another good example. Again, it was a Thistle Hotel, 900 bedrooms. Now it's a Hard Rock Hotel. You speak to the commercial director there they'll have some very interesting stats on their average room rate it's 
probably 40% above of what it could achieve without making that link. So by moving into these niches, you can leverage your rates and coming back to Juliet's point, selling less but charging more, which actually at the moment with the workforce struggles we have, you know, that makes sense commercially. Um, Steve, could you could you um, uh, uh, sell sell less and charge more, do you think? Yeah, I hope so. Um, <laughs> so one of the real pro problems that we have is that there's, there's mindsets in the, the, the visiting public. That, so we just have February half term, which is normally our busiest week of the year. And it's been spread out over two weeks this year just because of offset holidays for different local authority areas. Um, that's actually a good thing because pre-pandemic, you know, it could be a bit much. And I hate saying this as, you know, like the director of the venue, but it could be a bit much on certain days in that one week of the year. So actually having people spread out a bit more is better. I mentioned earlier that one of the things that we did um, to try and just keep staff morale going to give ourselves a bit of focus to give ourselves a bit of profile um, in 2020 was to do guided visits and that you know we talked about experiential but well, we've figured out again it's not rocket science but what's the best form of interpretation of storytelling well, it's a person isn't it so we have brilliant staff and we got them to to do these guided tours what we'd like to do is try and convert those into a premium experience been possibly made a little bit harder by the fact that we now can't cater. As I mentioned earlier, we had problems with our cafe. But it's something that we're actually looking at um, Buckinghamshire Boost for to, to look at the growth strand to see if that's something that can give us a little bit of... Sometimes small businesses that are working really, really hard to do what they do need a little bit of extra help. Uh, just in, Somebody used the word, I think Martin used the word earlier, catalyst. You need a little catalyst. So we're going to look at the growth strand of Buckinghamshire Boost to see if that catalyzes our effort on developing that more premium guided visit experience thank you right uh, we're going to rattle through these questions because um uh the, there's an awful lot to that, that, that um the audience can look forward to but um so briefly some super simple things we can do to become more accessible and sustainable i think this is one for you ross and also uh, possibly for, for wider discussion this is from tina redding how do we encourage our high streets to be more accessible. If you want to start on super simple things, maybe Ross and Juliet. Super Got simple one. things on accessibility. Everyone look at your website. If you can't see access for all or accessibility and have a clear section from your home menu, you're not meeting the needs of this group. Everyone can produce an accessibility guide. There's a free tool on our website, and that's a marketing document where you accurately describe the layout of your venue with photographs, and that's exactly the information that people need to make an informed choice. So top thing would be to do an accessibility guide. Uh, second, I think moving over to particularly for attractions, Toilets, you, you know, you can't look at accessibility provision without talking about toilet provision. If you can provide a changing places toilet, they are life changing for about a quarter of a million people uh, and they won't be able to visit your attraction unless you have a, that higher level toilet facility. So toilets and information. Um, and just a quick thing on, on high streets in particular, more accessible. I mean, take all the cars away, for example. Is that uh, high streets, you've got, to, you've got to be really careful uh, during COVID. Obviously, we're, we're coming out of this phase. Um, but there were instances where town centres had become less accessible because of COVID measures. You know, opening up pavements sounds great. Putting, uh, uh, you know, all of your tables and chairs out there so that you can attract that, that outdoor market that are worried about coming inside. Barriers for visually impaired people, people with assistance dogs. A-frames, we love to have these A-frames that you showed. Cluttering up pavements, really difficult for, for people with visual impairments. So think of, about ease of use for everyone, getting around your pavements, drop curbs and, and the like. Thank you. And Juliet, very, very, uh, very simple sustainability things yeah, to do, please. Hard to make it simple, but same with sustainability. Look at how your business is having an impact. How are you doing good for nature? How are you boosting biodiversity? How are you doing good for people? How are you having good social impact? Um, communicate that without greenwash, a word we haven't used today, yet it's so prolific right now Come in the last few years. That means when you're overstating your environmental impact. Um, and just making it easy for people to understand actual tips to be a more eco business. Um, emphasize plant food and vegetarian diets, reduce meat in your supply, keep your food print and your supply chain uh, zero miles, 
you know, buy as much as you can from other people in bucks would be a good start. Um, and to use a green energy supplier, uh, that would be a really uh, massive one. And just keep talking about sustainability. Fantastic. One more, one more question from the floor, perhaps a lady there in the middle. So a microphone is making its way south, I think, to you. You hear me? Um, I'm an independent tourism consultant. It's been brilliant listening to all the stuff this morning. But one thing, and I, I don't know if it's who, who it's really a question for, but does the panel feel that there should be um, a, something, a destination management plan which brings all the fantastic tourism products and, and thinks about possibly what might be next in Buckinghamshire together? So there's a sort of this point about collaboration and cohesiveness. Um, I think we've got lots of fantastic pockets of things that are going on. But I mean, I do some work for Visit Kent, which is sort of bills itself as a sort of Garden of England and Hertfordshire is trying to make it name for itself in terms of film tourism. What is the kind of USP for Buckinghamshire and, and how do we achieve that? Oh, crikey. Um, you've got one minute Sorry. again, everybody. Um, USP for Buckinghamshire. Should I take that one? Yes, um, go on. So we, we have the destination management organisation Visit Buckinghamshire that exists. There's actually a, um, a meeting 29th of March. Lucy, is there not coming up? So I think the, the, the framework is there. The framework is there. We'll be coming on to it a little bit later on. What this program is about is about supercharging that and really plugging in to bring the businesses together and make the most of that destination management organization through collaboration, sharing best practice and, and really selling the county. So I think, I think the structures are there. This is about pulling it uh, even more together, in my view. Thank you. And we got one more online question, which we will answer, which is, what are your pet hates when you stay in a hotel? Lightings, plugs, service. Um, yes, I'm going to answer this first one. Um, uh, when you can't just turn a light on and you can see everything, and you have to scrabble around to find somewhere to plug in your laptop and your phone and everything else. Um, and the best service I ever got was um, a tiny little hotel in Iona, um, where you just walk through the door and the uh, lady behind the counter just hands you the Wi-Fi code. Um, which is, sadly sums up my life. But um, uh, go on then, Anthony. Uh, what, what, what's your pet? One pet hate from a hotel. I still can't believe all these miniature shampoos I see. When I, I, I just, you know, it's 2022 now. There's so many more solutions. It's neatly lined up little row of little bottles. Pointless. Right. Not needed. Steve? A poor food. You know, particularly a poor breakfast. I want my breakfast to, to, to lift you know, my morning. And, you know, I've had some great breakfast in hotels, but a dispiriting breakfast buffet, it's not the way to start a day. Ross, you say lots of hotels? Well, that, that was stolen from me there. I was, <laughs> I was going to say generic sausage. Um, uh, I was staying in Bristol for a conference on Monday night. You know, if you're just having a, you know, standard, you, te you can tell it's not local. It, you know, it's not come from a butcher down the road. You know, that makes a point of difference on a breakfast everything else pretty much beans are beans um you know but, you know the meat the bacon and the sausages they should be lo locally sourced and you can tell the difference beans are beans but bucks beans are better there you right you have that one um uh, juliet go on then um i would say uh, anything that's soulless or corporate i want to feel there are human beings looking after me and it's a I, I like independently run businesses and to feel connected to people well, thank you so much. Um, there are human beings appearing after us, fortunately. Um, it's been ab an absolute pleasure to talk to you, Anthony and Steve and Ross and Juliet. Thank you so much. Lots more entertainment to come. And um, of course, if you have got a hotel, really helps if you're going to have background music to make sure it's either David Bowie or Jimi Hendrix. Been an absolute <laughs> pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for the opportunity. members and also to Simon for helming that so well this morning. I think it's been a brilliant morning so far and uh, it's great to so, see so many people in the audience too. So now we're on to the section of how we're going to make this all happen. How can Visit Buckinghamshire Boost help your business? So I'm very pleased to say I've got a great team who are going to join me up here in a moment who are going to talk to you about the five strands that Philip had touched on earlier and how those specific areas we have dedicated one-to-one -one support and advice to support your business on your journey um, to boost this. So we're going to touch on boosting green credentials, boosting your accessibility, boosting digital skills, boosting your workforce, boosting growth. So I'm very pleased to welcome Coke, 
I'm a climate change program manager at Buckinghamshire Business First. Daniel's going to take a little bit of time to talk about boosting your green credentials. Daniel, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think if, if it was only Simon that was clapping, I'm, I'm still okay with that. I'm still okay with that. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for giving me the time. We won't take too long on this. Uh, but of course, um, I'll be speaking today about the Boost Green Credentials element of the, the Boost program. Okay, so what Boost Green Credentials? I mean, a lot of these that you're going to see, you will know. You will have heard them time and time again, and you'll probably think, yep, yeah, we get the message. Visitors expect it. We've, we've already heard it today that, you know, visitors, tourists, they are expecting this more and more. We also have to think about that demographic. They, these same people are people who may not wish to go abroad. So we have to think, why do they not want to go abroad? One of those reasons could be climate. Certainly, that's a consideration I take. More and more, I think that's becoming a part of people's decision making. People want a guilt-free holiday. The whole, you know, uh, point of the holiday is to, is to enjoy it, right? Not to, to feel we're, we're doing wrong. Um, it will put your business at the forefront of, of the net zero agenda. So I think we all know that the big companies now are absolutely steamrolling ahead or something perhaps more efficient than steam, but they're really going for it. And the thing is, we have got to play catch up. So we have this support, we have this funding, but it is absolutely incumbent that you, you, know, you, you grasp it now because we've got the experts that can really take you along this journey. Uh, soon we'll be regulated. So, you know, if you're going to have to make this decision either way, uh, if you're going to have to make it now or in 12 months, 24 months, why not just make it now and at least get some of that kudos for, you know, being ahead for actually leading that little charge in Buckinghamshire. Um, you know, someone's got to, so why not you? Um, helps guide long-term business strategy. I think a lot of people feel nervous because they think, okay, I can see what kind of things we can do now. And I appreciate by 2040, 2050, I have to be at net zero. What am I doing in them decades in between? It's absolutely fair, really, obviously, excellent. We need the little things we can do, getting rid of the disposable cups, you know, shutting the windows, having the light, light on motion sensors. But what else can we do beyond that? And I think the worry for a lot of us as businesses is we can take that first step, but then what next? How do we keep that momentum? We think once we start this conversation, we're going to have to really keep on with pace. Otherwise, people will say, well, you're greenwashing or, you know, you're just waving a flag that's not actually hitting home what, what you're doing. And yeah, I've, I've written it's free. Now, free is a good thing. We, we write free and we can think, oh, well, you know, um, is it something I could have got anyway? I have to say the services and the consultants and the advice, the support, the funding we're giving is very real. So, of course, it's free to you, tourist businesses and those that support the tourism industry. But absolutely, this is real, real um, expertise that you get access to on the, on the um, carbon front. I'll just finish by saying here, the, the, the hockey stick kind of graph lift eight and a half times. What could it be within a year? Does anyone want to take a guess? Don't all shout at once. Okay. Uh, you, uh, over there. Mon Philippe. Well done, Philippe. Who knew? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Within, uh, within just a year, uh, two, two price points. We saw an eight and a half times rise in 12 months. Now, don't get me wrong. This fluctuates a lot. This is what businesses face. So it's not the same as those on a cap domestic market where perhaps we don't see this continual rise or kind of a step rise. However... This should really set alarm bells for you. There are two ways, really, to kind of safeguard against energy, um, energy, energy constraints and, and security. One is actually providing your own energy source, and then you're less dependent on the grid. But the other one is actually just making what you do at the moment more efficient. That's a, the most brilliant way you can safeguard yourself. Everything we see on the news, the horrors that we, we see and what will come, actually, on our end of things for energy, we can curtail some of those issues. Uh, people are saying, well, we're not dependent on Russia for gas. Absolutely fine. The problem is it's one planet and we're all going for the same supply. So it doesn't really matter who picks the gas up. It's all about how much um, there is. There. Absolutely. So today we've got climate essentials here. I would absolutely beg you to speak with them if you're a business. They can give you everything you would need to get on this journey and this it's this isn't greenwashing this is a real um 
this, it, it's a real opportunity to, to, to get on um, to, to, to get onto the decarbonisation road. I think people worry about the baseline. What happens if someone comes to me and says, "Show me how you've how you've calculated this"? People are worried they're going to be challenged that someone's going to pick apart what they've done. Well, we have experts at Climate Essentials who can guide you through all of this, and at the end of it, they can give you their logo to say, "No, we verify that you were taking these steps." At the end of that, they'll help to develop a decarbonisation report, which will get you on that road to net zero. So, you know, it, you could go to a consultant and consultants are absolutely great and there's a place for them, of course. But for those very small businesses, which, of course, we know they, they're part of who we are in Buckinghamshire, um, to, to, to put, you know, three, four thousand pounds up front is really difficult for consultancy on something you don't know. You can't see tangibly what benefits you're going to see in the long term. They are there, absolutely, but it's difficult to see. So this is the opportunity. There are no excuses now. Time, they will give you their time. Money, they won't give you their money, but we can certainly fund what they do. Um, so now's, now really is the time. And you can do it, you know, as a collective, which will make the journey all the easier. So just to finish up there, we have the Net Zero Buckinghamshire Collaboration Circle. This is an opportunity for those who want to go above and beyond or perhaps get involved in the joint conversation, how we drive Buckingham, Buckinghamshire forward as businesses in the environmental agenda. This is a really good opportunity. This is not just for big companies or those that have you know, become a B Corp. This is for everyone. It really is. So I really say if you want to scan it now, don't worry, I won't think you're taking a photo of me. Um, by all means do, but you, you, know, you, you can obviously find us on all the other resources. Um, so that's what we do. You'll see Climate Essentials out. So I, I really have to say, I think 75% of us said we were optimistic, which is really good because I thought, great, that's the 75% that will be going to Climate Essentials at the end of this. So, um, yeah, that's it from me. Thank you very much. And uh, I'll be about, please, please, please grab me or Climate Essentials and, and have the conversation. Brilliant. Thank you. I also forgot that I was then meant to introduce. Uh, <laughs> see, I do me fine. Yeah, I'm absolutely fine. So with over half a decade, I think, it, with Visit Books, is that right, Lucy? Something like She's that. not going to give me any clues, is she? She's going to say struggle with it. But Lucy is our tourism development manager. I mean, everyone knows her, of course, who, who is involved in tourism and, you know, the, the great work she's doing. So... Thank you very much, Lucy. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. And I have to say, it's lovely to see everybody today. I know Dan did say, it's nice to be here. Thank you for coming. But from my perspective, it, it, it's been a challenging two years for our sector. And it's just so nice to see people in person rather than through a screen. And it's great that you've been able to come and join us today to hear about our new programme. So I'm just going to talk about the boost, the accessibility um, with regards to um, this new programme of support. I know Ross has touched, and I think he stole some of my key points um, that I was going to talk about. But actually, what I think... <laughs> um, but I think, you know, what sort of, we sort of walked away from, from the earlier um, conversation and actually how low accessibility was on everyone's agenda. So I think this is just a good opportunity to reconfirm um, it is an important issue um, or an important area that we should be focusing on, which is why it's included in this um, programme of support. There is a compelling business case for making tourism venues um, inclusive and accessible, but actually this, was, this programme of support in terms of accessibility was born out of a visit we had from Sophie Morgan, who came last March. She came to see us um, as part of a Visit England three-day press trip. She is a TV journal, or she's a TV presenter, she's on Loose Women, she's a journalist, she presents on the Paralympics, but she's actually a wheelchair user. So she came here on a three-day visit to Butts, and from my perspective, um, it was hard to find accessible things for her to do. Um, and as we've said before, they want to come out and have fun. They want to have experiences. So we had the opportunity for her to come for three days and we really struggled of things to do. What we did find for her to do, she had a brilliant time and our businesses who um, participated in the three day trip were absolutely brilliant. But from my perspective, as an organizer of trying to find something for um, Sophie to do, it was really hard to A, find things for her to do but when I did find them, actually, it was, it was searching for a needle in a haystack. And I think it's as um, Juliet said, we need, to make the, we need to make the product easy for people to be able to find. So 
Sophie Morgan came to visit. She had a brilliant time, but it actually made us realise that not just in Barks, but we actually have a long way to go to create more accessible and inclusive product for all. As we said, there's a compelling business case um, for um, uh, investing in this market. 100 or 15, over 15 million, billion pounds are spent on trips in England from the purple pound. But actually, a large proportion of people do not travel. So that's missed revenue that as tourism businesses were missing out on. Also, the tourism sector, sector bill in 2019, one of the things, again, we should be focusing on accessibility, is that as part of the tourism sector deal, there is the ambition to make the UK the most accessible place in Europe in 2025. We need to make sure that Bucks is included in that piece of an accessible destination to visit. As we said, one in five people in the UK have a health condition and or impairment. So that's an awful lot of people that we're not tipping into. And also those that do travel are more likely to take longer trips. And one thing we haven't said here is actually they spend more than when they than a consumer who's not impaired. And actually, they're very loyal to the places that meet their requirements. And we've also touched upon that Stoke Mandeville is the birthplace of the Paralympics. It's a major USP for our county, which as yet we've not capitalised on. We should be reflecting our heritage and we should become the exemplar of an accessible destination to visit. The programme that we will soon be launching with regards to boost your accessibility is in uh, partnership with Buckinghamshire Disability Service, known as BUDS. Um, they are a user-led uh, pan disability charity operating predominantly in Buckinghamshire. They are a successful, dynamic, and influential charity, and they focus on supporting disabled people by fixing the biggest issues that face um, these um, that face their user group. The support that will be available, we will have um, a business access advisor who will be able to come to your business and be able to do a site audit. Now, I think the thing that we need to say here is that they won't be coming in and saying you need to spend huge amounts of money to make your business accessible. Also, your business might, might not be accessible to all. That's fine. They're here to tell you that by doing a few small things can make a big difference to your business. We'll also have um, the one-to-one -one support as well. In addition to the site audits, there will be one-to-one -one support available to guide you through the process of making your business more accessible and more inclusive. So you'll be able to keep your team and businesses up to date with our online library of resources, hints and tips and sharing back practice. And also Ross alluded to, there's brilliant stuff on the Visit England website as well in terms of resources to help you on this journey. And there'll also be some free training available for your teams to help make customers with access needs feel welcome and comfortable when visiting your, your business. You'll also see this Fair for All um, logo here. This is an initiative that Bucks, uh, that Buds have uh, launched actually during the pandemic. And what it is, is it's a photo card. So as a business, um, you can take part in this Fair for All card, whereby uh, a user um, who is disabled will have this card. And as a business, you'll be able to see what amendments and enhancements you need to do in order to accommodate this business. And I think it's a win-win situation in terms of at the end result, we'll have a positive experience from the user because we've been able, as a business, we've been able to meet their needs. And as a business, you'll be able to accommodate those needs and in and so much as we'll then have a better customer experience. So as part of the scheme, you'll be able to sign up as a business fair for all card. And just to say there are a number of businesses within Buckinghamshire that use the fair for all card, um, which includes major businesses, supermarkets, the theatres, etc. So it, it's a great initiative to be able to be part of. So just to sum up with regards to the programme, um, we'll also be, be creating, which I think it was Ross said as well, which is hands on heart, we don't have a brilliant accessible area on our, on our Visit Bucks website. And as part of this piece of work, we will have an area on the website, which absolutely will make it very easy for anybody who wishes to book an accessible room or, would, or has um, somebody who's on the neuro neurodiverse um, spectrum we will have an area on the website that will really be able to be a prominent area on the website that will detail all the accommodation that is accessible, the venues that are accessible, um, places that do have hearing loops, etc. So it will be a one-stop shop, for want of a better word, that's easy for the consumer to be able to find, um, to, to find the product that meets their needs. And also through distributing your products and services through the, uh, through the Visit Buckingham 
Buckinghamshire website, you're obviously be tapping into potential customers within Bucks and through the Visit Bucks website, but also to the wider tourism market, so through Visit England, etc. So it's a good opportunity once we've embarked on this journey to actually tap into this market through the likes of Visit Bucks and Buckinghamshire and the wider market. That's it. Thank you. And I'm going to introduce to John. John Browning is our... Can't wait till you come. <laughs> Yes, what am I? You are our workforce <laughs> skills. Uh, so wait and see, see you to come to our workforce skills manager who's going to talk about um, boosting our digital skills and workforce. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm a bit disappointed nobody could name a music festival um, in Bucks. The Towersy Festival is taking place, August Bank Holiday Weekend. Kate Rusby headlining, it's going to be brilliant. Uh, <laughs> It's moved to Buckinghamshire, Claydon Estate, yes. And I actually organise a music festival, Newton Longville, 2nd of July. Uh, free entry, everyone welcome. I'm part of the schedule, Grand Prix Open Grand Prix, you also organise one of these festivals. Already there's three. <laughs> Four. I think we'll move on to uh, skills if that's okay. Um, so, uh, yes, thank you very much, Lucy. Um, my role at uh, Bucks Business First is uh, Workforce Skills Manager, so I spend uh, a lot of time with businesses, talking to them about their recruitment, training, and skills needs, and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about two initiatives today. One is called uh, Boost Digital Skills, and the other is called Boost Your Workforce. So I'll start with uh, digital skills. What do I mean by digital skills? Um, obviously, increasingly, businesses rely on technology these days, and that's absolutely true for the hospitality, leisure, and tourism sectors. So I have a question for you. Are you making the most of the marketing opportunities provided by your website and your social media accounts? Um, if you are secretly thinking, well, we really could be a bit better, then this program is for you. We've teamed up with uh, People First um, to develop a series of online workshops to help you develop your digital marketing and social media strategies, to help you reach the right customers. Some of you hopefully will have heard of People First. They've been supporting skills in the uh, hospitality, leisure and tourism sectors for many years. We'll cover uh, how to develop your online presence, getting the digital marketing right, making the best use of your social media activity, and dealing with your customer reviews. They run in a series. They're aimed at you, everybody here, and those people in your businesses that deal with your digital marketing and social media. Um, they are completely free to attend. And they will be running during the course of March, April, and May. And you can sign up today uh, on the uh, Boost Digital Skills stand, which is just outside the front door here. Uh, we'd be delighted to see you. Now then, perhaps you need um, some support with some other uh, digital skills. Uh, Maybe you're concerned about uh, cyber security. Uh, perhaps you need to brush up on your Microsoft skills. Perhaps it's cloud computing, your CRM, or networking that, um, that you're finding difficulty with. Well, we can help you find solutions for those too, working through uh, local training providers. Some of them are here today. Uh, we've got Bucks College Group who have an excellent offer. Uh, go and see their stand today. And we also have digital marketing training here who have a lot of expertise in these areas. And don't forget, you can use your £250 voucher um, to, uh, towards the cost of, uh, of that training. Just a quick plug for my day job. Um, don't forget that um, we are here to support you if you need support in any of these areas. So do please get in contact with me. Come and talk to me at lunch, um, and uh, we can help you support you in uh, many of these areas. Um, but now I just want to move on and talk a little bit about recruitment. Um, we know this is extremely difficult at the moment. Um, you can, of course, come and talk to us about that. I don't have a magic wand. Um, 
But we are working with the Job Centre Plus and with the government restart scheme providers to promote jobs in the visitor economy. So it's worth coming and having a chat. One thing we are thinking about is how do we encourage the next generation um, of people to be excited about their careers in these sectors? And uh, so I have a, qu a request for you. Um, can you help us shape the next generation? Uh, we are um, uh, we are teaming up with Bucks College Group to put on an event for Bucks College students. We're calling it the Talent Showcase Workshop. It's aimed at uh, their hospitality and catering, beauty, and some other students at the college who will be looking to start their careers this summer. Uh, takes place on the 11th of May um, and in Aylesbury. Uh, and it's intended to prepare them for their job search. And we would be keen to bring some employers along to take part in a series of activities. We're hoping to have some inspirational talks about careers, perhaps sort of speed interviews, CV clinic, uh, panel discussion, those kinds of activities to help those people get excited about their future careers. And uh, so if you could spare some time to help us with that, that would be great. It would be an opportunity to meet some of the people who might very well in a few months' time be working for you. And that's it from me. Thank you very much. Back to Anthony. Super. Thanks very much, John. So um, it's up to me to wrap up. So we're going to talk a little bit about the growth strand. And, and obviously, I know there's a number of businesses here. I've already had conversations with this morning around growing business, which is a very salient point. So you'll notice that we've been talking about accessibility, workforce, digital skills, um, and boosting green credentials. All elements of those strands feed into growth. By boosting the green credentials, obviously, there is um, a win-win. We're offering you access to a market-leading platform uh, free of charge to get you on the journey to net zero, um, benchmark your carbon footprint, and at the same time, help you reduce your costs. But what boosting green, your green credentials also do, and Juliet touched on this earlier, a 85% of travellers on Bookit.com are seeking uh, a sustainable stay or a sustainable visit. Um, Google now, in their search for travel, are ranking businesses and they're considering their green credentials as well. So, and Juliet also highlighted, there's probably a gap in the, in the market in Buckinghamshire for hospitality businesses who showcase what they do really, really well. So, boosting your green credentials boosts growth. Boosting your workforce. I've worked in this industry for 30 years. I've spent 20 years hiring people in this industry. It's never been easy, let's be honest. And um, what we've seen over the years, we've had various areas where we've been able to recruit from the European Union or other countries. I remember back in the late 90s, I was recruiting South Africans, Australians, Kiwis coming to work in our businesses. So if you don't have a workforce in our industry, you don't really have a business because, as Juliet said, you need people to deliver experiences. I've also worked in Bucks uh, previously, and I actually attended the skill show seven years ago, the Bucks Skill Show, which John didn't touch on, but I'll touch on. Um, it's a brilliant event. There are 5,000 young people over two days in one roof at Westcott on the 9th and 10th of March. When I joined the programme a couple of weeks ago, I could not believe how few hospitality and leisure tourism businesses are actually signed up to attend. You've got 5,000 youngsters, and we all know people make career choices very young. I think it's as young as seven. We haven't got any seven-year-olds there, but we've got a tranche of people all living in Bucks, all wanting to um, learn about careers. And you've got this brilliant program right on your doorstep. So again, I'd encourage as many of you as you can to get along. I think there's still a few limited spaces, John, but get along and speak to that future generation, boost your workforce. Boosting digital skills. One of the things I found 
during last summer, I was helping a very, very business on the South Coast, very busy business. Everything was changing so quickly. Supply chain, your menus run out. You need to close out your website because you're fully booked. You need to change your marketing message. We hit major barriers because we didn't have enough people within that business who had digital skills. And what that meant was we had a large number of very disappointed guests turning up to that business and we didn't communicate well enough with them. If we had that skill set within the business, because as we all know now, things have really changed. Things have rapidly, rapidly accelerated. So the digital skills workshops that we've, we've put together are aimed at business owners and they're also aimed at your teams. As we know, things are moving at fast pace. So it's important that we have the team skilled up within your business who can manage your digital marketing, social media presence. We all know how powerful reviews are, uh, how often the reviews left un unanswered, how often do you not even know you have a review, and that's your audience looking at your business. So boosting your digital skills, getting as many of your team members involved in that piece will boost growth because that then it's all about your online presence, your customers will see how you respond to reviews. That will boost growth. That will drive businesses who will trust you, that they, you listen to your customers. If you get it wrong, you try and put it right. Boosting accessibility. I think, again, as Juliet, Juliet touched on, it's not just about the green agenda. I'm not Sorry, not just about accessibility. It's about sustainability too. And um, people are seeking out those authentic, sustainable experiences. A couple of years back before the pandemic, I was running a very nice uh, place in the Cotswolds. Um, and, you know, we had a major A-list star come and stay with us. And we're thinking, what are we going to do? What are we going to put? You know? She wanted to go and dig veg in the garden. That's what she wanted to do. And she did it for the day. And she loved it. Didn't cost us anything, but she loved it. So, and um, so, in terms of the accessibility piece as well, as Ross highlighted, it's not just um, people with mobility issues, it's other areas where we need to improve our businesses' accessibility, both online, in print, and um, in our actual venues ourselves. Which brings me neatly on to boosting growth. So I'm very lucky again to have a, a team of business advisors who are here to support you in growing your business. So when you enroll on the program, you will receive one-to-one uh, -one dedicated, dedicated support from business advisor. That includes me, as well as the program manager. I'm there for you as well. And we're currently working with 44 businesses who have signed up to the program so far. There's a number of you in this audience who've registered to come today, haven't yet signed up for Boost. Please do, if you have any queries, you're not sure how to, come see Ian, I, or any of the team over lunch, and we'll get you signed up. Through that, you'll have full access to the suite of growth support available within Buckinghamshire Business First. We also have £250 vouchers for you to use in your business to boost growth through initiatives. And that could be putting it towards a piece of technology to improve your digital experience for your guests. It shocks me, actually, how many businesses neglect to look at the tech and the data behind the glossy facade. Operating systems... We've seen, again, we've seen the industry move so quickly. How many people have been to a pop-up business over the last two years? Pop-up pizza, pop-up food, it's popping up everywhere. Look at the technology they're using. Look at how they're taking payments. Look at how they're managing bookings and promoting themselves. One of the outcomes has been, as there always is during a depression or a recession or a major change, you see innovators start up. If you're looking to collaborate, then there are operators in this uh, young operator who are just starting out doing some really cool, interesting stuff. By coming into the program, you'll get to collaborate them through, with, through the collaboration circle, through Net Zero, through the activity with uh, Bucks Destination Management, and through um, the range of programs that we're putting forward to um, boost um, your digital skills and workforce. And lastly, innovate. So I've just put that at the, the last, that last piece there, and it just touches back on, you know, the world has changed. We all know the world has changed. We all know the way we do business has changed. Um, 
now is the time to really look at your business. We've all had a lot of time over the last two years to really look at how our business is working. We've seen lots of things accelerate, lots of trends accelerate. Um, and now some of those trends are actually here to stay, I think. So again, touching on the staycation piece, I really do believe that people will take more travel in this country and less long haul. It will return. And likewise, inbound tourism will come back to this country. You know, we're a global destination and it will return. But at this moment in time, we know Americans don't travel during times of crisis. The European market is probably more likely to be our first port of call. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how you can access those markets. So in April and May, we'll be hosting a number of workshops to the tourism, visitor and leisure economy. Um, we're working with our partners, Visit England, um, and we're also developing our own suite of workshops. We're going to be talking about developing a bookable product. So this is the nuts and bolts of how to develop your product to be found, demystifying the myths of commission, looking at different booking systems that you can plug your business into, channel management, so how your business is distributed, um, and an introduction to the TXGB Visit England system, which will plug your business in to the, um, the National Tourist Board uh, for England and promote your products globally. We'll be talking about experiment experiential tourism. So I gave an example there of the A-lister digging veg, which if you just said that to me 10 years ago, I would have said you'll, no, that would, that, that's not an experience, but it is. Knowledge is cool. People want to know how things work. People want to come to your distillery, learn how you distill gin. They want to go to your brewery, learn how you make it. And then they'll have a drink at the end and probably have some food. And hey, there'll be a live band there too. So developing these tourism experiences, hearing from the experts and really seeing some best practice of who's doing it really, really well. Taking England to the world, again, this is about getting your business ready for the return of the global tourism market. And it will return. It will return. And experience tourism development. So this is about developing an authentic product or guided or guided experience. Um, people are seeking these out. They want to learn um, as part of their travel. They want to know more about your story. They want to get to know your business more. And, you know, the last 20 years, I've worked in independent venues. Do you absolutely know where you're coming from? You know, you get to speak to the maker or the owner or the person who's actually put their neck on the line to build this business. Nothing better than that for people. And it's for moving away from the sort of corporate soulless um, tourism and more into the experiential led tourism um, sector is really what is actually knowing the county really well and knowing um, what we do here. We already have a very rich scene that just needs to be exploited and promoted a little bit more. So I'm going to wrap up now. We've got a, a, a few questions um, just to sense check the room and then I won't keep you all from lunch. I know we're running a little bit over. So, okay. We are still sat here because we've spoken on each of these. Yeah. <laughs> the credentials comes out at the bottom. I'm, I'm not going to take that to positive. <laughs> Not okay. okay. Here we go. Whoa, they're up and down. So green credentials there. 62. Digital skills. Nice to see accessibility registering. Growth and diversification. Okay. Come and speak to me at lunchtime. Growth and diversification. So green credentials has clearly hit a mark. Okay, would you like a follow-up call from our team to discuss any of the below themes? Let's see how this looks. Hansi, can I just say, sorry. Yeah. So obviously I've listened to the whole thing, I think it's a fantastic panel, really interesting. But I do think that we've missed a trick. Okay. You know? So just to give you the context of so my background, so my company's in Sweden, Pakistan, and I specialise in experience-based and community-based tourism. Yeah. To Pakistan, but I'm now looking to develop experiences here in the UK. Brilliant. I'm looking to collaborate with some fellow hoteliers and restaurants in the Parks region to bring the experience to Pakistan here in the UK. Mm -hmm. 
So I think one bear for me that way you missed is you've not talked about diversity and inclusion. Okay. I think it's a missed opportunity. Yeah. And I think particularly given Brexit and given the climate, I think there's a real opportunity that we can play up and, and the change of demographics and bugs, which I think is a missed opportunity. And family friendly, you know, if you think about and I talk about as a mum of three kids, yeah. my kids are a lot older, but when they were younger, the big criteria for me and why we like to go to Egypt or where why we like to go overseas is you've got the resorts where you've got the, the family activity. So, you know, we could go scuba or snorkeling and kids from the kids' club. And here's some of the challenges here where I think again it's a it's a bit of an easy win where if you go to at the moment we did a trip to in Wales for glamping, which is great because they had an activity for three or four hours which was involves arts and crafts with kids. So it meant for those three or four hours my husband and I could go and do some so I could do some adult stuff while the kids were the park. And I think where you know kind of increasing as a family we will look to do domestic tourism because when you think of PCR costs and all that it's just too expensive. And that's where I think maybe some of the hotels will um, could be a bit more clever with um, having work or workshops or experiences for two three hours so that the parents can enjoy those spa facilities. Not, because there's no point having those if you've got kids because you can't use them. So I think for me, you know, I think there are a few quick wins that we yeah. missed today. Well, that's interesting because that really does feed into the growth and diversification conversations. Mm. And uh, just touching on your point about family friendly. Um, in the last few months, I was working with a business which um, had a very active kids program. And it's David Willis here. Is he here today? David. So we've got a bushcraft expert in the audience today, or we were due to. And actually, we put on a very broad range of family-friendly activities. We also had a spa. And uh, it was amazing, actually, the traction we had from people coming to stay with us because they knew that every member of the family would be looked after and had a great time. And bushcraft, and again, that knowledge and learning, was a phenomenally successful um, program. And actually, for this summer, the uh, kids' activity program in that business has been quadrupled. So the activities are running seven days a week um, because they can directly link that change to driving higher rated stays. Again, not necessarily higher volume, but people preparing, preparing to spend more because they're having a, a broader experience. So I think that's absolutely right. And just coming back to the, the inclusion piece, very much that forms part of our partnership with, with BUDS and the access advice and working across accessibility and inclusivity. You're absolutely right. So that is does form part of our program. So I just so I just want to add to that, you know, one of the growth sectors is the tourism. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a booming industry. And of the destinations that you get people, not just most but overseas, you know, UK, England is up there. Um, so I think again there's some um, easy wins in terms of you know, maybe have more halal offerings yeah. and, and thinking about that will be certainly in the box because box is quite appealing and I say obviously from Pakistan heritage but have family visit um, that because of its green and because of countryside so you don't get as much maybe so people do like to come here and, and sure. I think sometimes the barrier is because as Asians we're big foodies and we love our food and we love our meat is that oh well London's great but outside of London the offering's just not there yeah well I think that again feeds into the the the, the, the whole the, you know, the niche discussions is creating niches and, and finding niches and finding opportunities um, and being excellent at it, you know? Okay. Well, better than a follow-up call, Climate Essentials are here today. So Anna's in the audience from Climate Essentials. So if you haven't already stopped by to see Anna, please do so. And uh, another question, are you a member of Visit Buckinghamshire? DMO or Buckinghamshire Business First. Are you a member? That's good. 71, 56. Okay. Okay. Yes, huge potential. I've been involved with destination management organizations for over 10 years and got tremendous value about out of being a member of your local destination management organization. So um, I think if you're not a member of Visit Buckinghamshire, um, again, Lucy's here today, the team are here today. I'm very happy to talk to you about that um, and joining. And thank you very much indeed. And uh, enjoy your lunch. Thank you to all of our panel, all of our team from Visit Buckinghamshire and the marketing team who put the event on today and all of you for joining us. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>